Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenny Bailey, and I am the Director of Partnerships Communications at British Rowing, and I work alongside Annie Parkinson, our CEO, and the executive team, as well as colleagues and volunteers from across British Rowing. Thank you for joining us for what is now lockdown webinar number 17. Uh, spearheaded by James Andrews, British Rowing's Head of Performance Talent, we have run 16 lockdown webinars over the last eight weeks, covering topics ranging from our own rower development guide, mental health, technical rowing advice, training tips, life with the GB rowing team, and uh, many more topics. If you are looking for an alternative to Netflix these days, then we have five more planned over the coming weeks, and you can find all the information on our lockdown webinars at the British Rowing website. Um, before uh, before we get into uh, the questions tonight and get going properly, a little bit of housekeeping. Due to uh, the terrific attendance, uh, I'm looking, we are now up to about 225 people attending. Uh, there are a lot of you turning up, so we'll be muting the noise to keep to a minimum. And I'd ask that anyone submit questions through the question box uh, in the control panel. This evening's webinar is about British Rowing's recent return to rowing guidance for rowers, clubs, coaches, competitions, as well as a wider rowing community on how we get the sport going again now that the lockdown is beginning to lift. And I am delighted to introduce Andy Parkinson, CEO of British Rowing, Dr Anne Redgrave, British Rowing Chief Medical Officer, and Nick Hubble, Board Member and Chair of the Sport Committee. For those of you who have not yet had the chance to read version two of our guidance, then you can find it now on the homepage of the British Rowing website. We published that today. There are many elements of detail tonight that we need to follow up on after this webinar, and we will do so within the news story that covers uh, tonight's webinar. Andy, Anne and Nick are here to answer uh, your questions and also questions that have been pre-submitted prior to tonight's uh, event. So please do send them in via the question box. But before we get going into the questions, I'm going to ask Andy to run you through where we stand at the moment with regards to British Rowing's approach to coronavirus. Andy, over to you. Thanks very much, Kenny. It's amazing looking at these attendees just ticking up 244. Um, I guess we'd better say something helpful and important, right? Um, thanks very much for that, Kenny. Um, and it's uh, it's great to be on this webinar. I think we've got a presentation here. So let me see if I can click it on. Um, I guess from my perspective, what I wanted to go through was try and give a bit of context to the last three months, if that's at all possible. It seems like a long time ago that coronavirus hit the country and we've moved pretty quickly from normal life to lockdown. Uh, there was one I was reflecting on, on sort of what I could tell you, and there was one moment where we sat down as a senior leadership team, and I guess it must have been the week of the 8th of May, 8th of March, excuse me, and we had a conversation around, look, we needed to get prepared for what this might be without really having an awful lot of knowledge about it. And we'd identified a single staff person, Jack Mercer, who's a performance program support manager, and he seemed like the ideal guy to really try and gather all the information together. And I, I said to him a day later, I said, look, I've got no idea if this is going to be a flash in the pan and we won't need this monitoring group for more than three or four days, or we could end up having to deal with the cancelled Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, and I'm certainly not suggesting I've got a, a, had a crystal ball at that point, but it's been amazing the speed at which we've had to move, you've had to move and everything that's happened. So, I mean, from then, we 17th of March, we suspended all competitions, closed the office. A couple of days later, we closed the National Training Centre right after national trials. We advised events and clubs to stop activity on the 20th of March. And then we had the postponement of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And that feels like it feels like months ago. And it was only, what, two or three months. So there's so much has changed in that time. Let me just click it on. Um, and I guess what's been so in, so incredible is watching the rowing community's response. We've had many members who've been on the front line in healthcare, food supply, delivery, teachers. We've had clubs lending trailers to, to local communities. We've also seen fantastic ingenuity and creativity from our members about 
keep it engaged, inspiring their communities, Zoom fitness sessions, virtual head races, indoor rowing, and, and actually just general catch ups around the community, really, I guess, reinforcing for me the, the essence of rowing clubs in those communities. So before we get too far into this, I just want to say thanks to every single one of you who's contributed to, to keeping the, the spirits of our rowing family high during this really difficult time. And also recognizing that many people have had a really tough time, uh, a really serious tough time in, in these circumstances with family and friends challenges, you know, life and death situations, and obviously the economic and, and employment fallout of what's going on. So, you know, thank you very much for everything you've done. Um, I'd also say, oh, there we go. Ah, it's gone too far. I knew that would happen. Uh, let me forget the slide. I guess one of the things that that has been absolutely overwhelming at times at the moment uh, in the last few months is the amount of guidance that's been changing, published, issued almost by the hour sometimes, particularly going into that lo lockdown phase. It wasn't just government guidance, there was guidance from local councils, water authorities, which was obviously a, a key focus for us, schools, universities, and we at the same time have had to try and interpret that, provide some guidance to you, the rowing family, as best we possibly can based on the information we've had at the time. Going into lockdown, I think it was, well, it certainly was, it, it, it was more simple and straightforward. It doesn't feel like that right now, but it was simple and straightforward. We all knew at, at one point that the ultimate aim of this was to lock down the country. So it was really a question of how fast are we going to do it as a, as a sport and how, which parts were we going to do first? And I think, and I get the sense from everyone right now that coming out of the lockdown is, is, is much more challenging. It's more challenging because people are tired. Uh, people are, want to get back out in the water and I, I don't blame you. Um, we have government guidance that is changing and is potentially less clear than it was previously. Um, and fundamentally, we don't have all the answers to everything. And if, if you take anything from this session, uh, hopefully you'll take some more, but we don't have all the answers. We have operated on a basis that we need as much information as possible. We need to make good, solid judgment decisions as quickly as possible. And we need to communicate those as clearly as possible. And that's, in essence, how we've tried to operate throughout this crisis. We've also had to make sure that there are a range of, there's a range of impacts on everything that the government is doing on rowing. So what we've done is set up different groups with different skill sets. So whether that's facilities, coaching, competitions, all of which are in development, our return to Hammersmith, our return to training environments for our elite team, um, our return to rowing generally. So we have really sucked in as much expertise as we possibly can, created skill set groups that consist of members, volunteers, staff. And I think one of the really pleasing things for me during this period is the collaborative spirit in which we've made decisions. Uh, and it's been, you know, everyone has pulled together as you would hope and expect them to. We've had to operate on a number of key guiding principles, which take in, into account our safeguarding responsibilities, our water, safe, water safety responsibilities. Um, and I hope, uh, I certainly had quite a bit of feedback positive in, in the fact that I hope that what we've done by setting out this phasing that you can see in front of you, which is intended to, to map across onto the government's phase, which as you know, is level four right now. Um, we hope that it gives you sight into how we think we can get back to whatever the new normal is. So that's probably it from me. What I would say is just as a final thank you, thank you to all the clubs that have responded to our request for information about the pandemic. Uh, it's been really important for us to understand what's happening in Clubland, how it's impacting you, because then we can design programs and, and products that, that again, help you come back. We've been fortunate to have our funding partners support us really well. Sport England came through with, with commitment of funding through to March 22, very early on in the piece. We're in ongoing conversations with UK Sports. Uh, and I think we're pretty fortunate that we're in a reasonable financial position at the moment. We're clearly going to rely heavily on our membership income over the coming months and years. 
but we think we've we've really done well in terms of good engagement with you the clubs and with you the members uh, and i guess the final bit from me is really sort of telling you that we agreed at a board level that we would uh, develop a club emergency fund for clubs who are in particular need of help as a result of COVID-19. And at the end of this webinar, then we'll be publishing the process and criteria for that club emergency fund. Uh, please look at it. If you've got any questions, then essentially ask the team. So I'm sure you can hear from me later on and, and also I'm sure you'll get far more information about what your club can do from both Anne and, and Nick over the course of 50 minutes. That's me, Kenny. Many thanks, Andy. Um, hopefully you can all still hear me. Um, and I couldn't agree more on, uh, on seeing the number of fantastic initiatives started by clubs across the country. Uh, we are actually showcasing a number of them uh, on our website, so britishrowing.org forward slash coronavirus. Um, if any clubs out there are, are running interesting programs, projects, fun competitions, anything at all that you think you'd like the rest of the community to hear about, then please email them into club support at britishrowing.org. Um, before we get into the uh, specific questions, of which there are many, and many coming in um, already on the, uh, the questions panel, I thought it might be quite interesting for everybody to understand a little bit from, from Nick and Anne, who have both been involved in rowing for a long time, how they feel um, uh, coronavirus has affected the sport. Nick, I mean, like many people joining us tonight, you're massively involved as a volunteer in the sport. What do you sense has been the impact around clubs and across the sport over the last two or three months? Oops. Oops. Problem with sound. Again, sorry, I think it's hard to tell at, at this stage. Um, it's been a fairly long road. We cancelled events at the beginning of the year, um, and then this comes along. Um, you know, we've got can we've got cancelled events going all the way through the summer. Um, we've got pause memberships, um, but I think there's some great creativity out there from um, from clubs, from coaches, from volunteers, from the regions, um, all trying to pull together. Um, as Andy said, you know, we've had people out there doing Zoom circuits um, to Friday night quizzes and things, which has been really great. But there's one thing: there's lots of people working really hard, I think, to try and keep their clubs going. And that's that's really encouraging. Um, and what else? Everybody's, I think, seeing people's plans for coming back to rowing. Everybody's being fairly sensible about the approach they take, which is really, really good. And Nick, you've been involved with uh, with a number of uh, with the return to rowing group, and also been through your position and your experience within the sport, advising on a number of other areas, from listening to how the GB rowing team are. Are looking at their own return to training environment and and then back to competitions and, and opening club facilities do you do you sense that there's a real uh, spirit across the whole sport of you know acting as one community yeah i do i think i mean i just say i guess i'm in a fairly i guess privileged position to to talk to people and know what's going on with the, with the team as well and everything and i i i really do get that sense that it's sport wide um, and one thing is, you know, there's a cross there that we shouldn't be rushing back into this. Everybody's desperate to get out in boats, fully accept that, but let's just take our time and let's be really careful how we do this. Thank you. And Anne, I mean, as the GB Rowing Team's doctor and uh, British Rowing's Chief Medical uh, Officer, this coronavirus must have been one of the most difficult situations you, you've had to handle. Indeed, Kenny. It's been it's been interesting, difficult as you say, and and challenging in many ways. But the interesting thing for the individuals in the team who are now spread across the country, um, everyone is training remotely. Everyone's achieving uh, training as they would hope, actually. Um, and I think that's been a pleasant surprise for us that we managed to keep the team in training. Uh, when we first locked down, we thought we were still going to be competing in Tokyo in a few weeks time. Uh, that now is obviously not on the cards for another year, but we can't afford to detrain uh, very much um, because we train 52 weeks a year. And so it's been important for the athletes to keep going. The challenge though has been 
more in the in mental health than physical health to be honest you know lockdown is not how we exist we're all in isolation some of the athletes actually being completely on their own for the whole of the 10-week period others went home but the challenge of not being in their normal environment doing things as they would normally has actually been quite a big toll and, and probably from a medical perspective that's the bit we've had to work the hardest at you know physical injury hasn't been too bad the physios have managed to work remotely but from a from a from a toll point of view the mental health has been the biggest toll okay i mean just that's an interesting point physiotherapy i mean it's amazing to think physiotherapy can be done remotely but with you know with isolation and social distancing i mean it's as difficult for the staff as it is for the athletes absolutely and actually i think we've all had to learn to work in a different way you know we've all been on zoom on google hangouts doing everything by, by video or phone calls the beauty of doing it by video is you can actually get uh, the athletes to to perform um, movements as they would when they're in front of you so you can actually assess what you think is happening of course you can't put your hands on but you can give guidance about what you would think they need to do in order to self-help and, and fortunately in the vast majority of cases we've not needed to move beyond that and the athletes have actually managed to to calm their issues down so i think it's a learning curve for everybody because when we're at cavisham they're straight into the physio but they've had to learn to to be a little more considerate to their bodies Oh, okay. Well, th thank you very much. Um, and you know, so I think at some point, hopefully, we can touch on a little bit about how the GB rowing team are taking steps to uh, to get back to normal training um, at some point. Um, but I, I think there's been a huge number of questions uh, put forward, and just looking at some of the questions that have come in uh, in advance of the webinar, we've we sort of put them into categories. Uh, they seem to have been under a, a number of categories, crew boats, um, cleaning, um, junior rowing launches, um, coaching. So much of the, the questions and many of the answers to the questions we've tried to address in the today's uh, version or the publication we've published today in the website uh, of the Return to Rowing Guide. But if we take a few specific questions, uh, have been submitted already um, and what we've tried to do I think so everybody can understand how we are trying to uh, to answer them um, so corporate or governance or business communications British rowing questions we feel Andy's the best person to tackle them um, science and medical and and then club rowing community Nick um, so what if you find me sort of uh, pivoting towards any one of the three you'll you'll understand why hopefully so we have a question come in on crew boats from um, a Mr. David McDermott at Exmouth. Um, and he said Exmouth is a coastal rowing club, um, rowing single, double and coxed quad skulls. We're about uh, the, the use of singles and doubles from the same households. In our quads, the crews sit 1.3 metres apart. We propose to allow pairs of quads to be launched in the very benign tidal weather conditions. Uh, with Cox number three and bow providing 2.6 metres apart. All crew members will be required to experience rowers, no novices, rowing in pairs. Quads will provide additional safety to allow recovery from our beach using the six available from the two crews. A risk assessment has been completed. Um, outside toilet and an outside hand washing station have been set up. So a very, looks like a very thorough um, process that uh, they've, they've gone to. Um, Nick, I mean, is there anything else you think they might want to consider? Or for a start, do you think uh, what they've done is is, is good? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they've, they've gone through the, the thought process clearly. Um, I, I'm guessing that the quad is going to be used as a double, um, a Cox double by the same household. Um, if that is the case, then you know th there isn't a social social distancing issue there. Um, you know they're they're probably closer in their households than they are when they when they're actually getting this boat. I think one thing um, I would probably look at, and I'm sure it's in their risk assessment, is but la launching the boats um, and recovering them. You know, watch the touch points on boats if you've got two boats going out together from different households. Um, they're fairly heavy um, holes. So again, you know, it's th thinking about cleaning, thinking about touch points, social distancing, really. 
Okay, uh, and I, so whether the distance is two meters or one meter, um, uh, you know, if social distancing was reduced to one meter, do you think what impact do you think that would have on crew boats being able to go out? I think that's a really, really difficult one um, at this moment in time, and I think it's it's certainly something we we would need to look much deeper into. Um, I think my concern would be if a crew's all rowing together then theoretically yes they're always a meter apart um my concern would be you know you you stop at the end of a, a session or stop at the end of a piece um somebody sitting at backstop somebody thinks oh, i need to adjust my feet so they move forward all of a sudden that meter's gone um i think we you know we would need to be doing it and thinking about some really really controlled conditions with it and, and whether it's actually practical okay okay um and can, and I, I guess I was, can I jump in on that? Because because yeah. I think I mean we were having this when we was when we set up for the webinar we were having this conversation about this particular question and I think it's really interesting that we've we've spent so much time trying to look at the guidance trying to overlay it onto a onto a rowing specific environment but every single situation is different. Um, and I think what impressed me most about the question was the fact that all these checks have been done, there's been a risk assessment completed, and fundamentally it's about individuals out there being sensible, being cautious, adhering to the, the government advice, and making every best effort to make sure that we're doing what we can to protect the public health. So, I mean, there's a lot of technical answers to the questions, but fundamentally that risk assessment is so important. Sorry, Kenny, I, I said I wasn't going to try and get involved in this question, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's great. And I think you're right, Andy, to, to highlight it as an example of good practice uh, from a club. And do you, uh, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I just think the other thing that that it's fair to say is, uh, you know, certainly at at um, uh, uh, elite GB team level, we have to assess the health of the athletes every day. And you could suggest that the one thing that that Evesham could add in was Evesham, wasn't it? Um, they they yeah. could just check yeah. before they allow people to boat that they are remaining healthy. You know, if they're feeling healthy and they know that no one's had any symptoms and they haven't got a temperature, then then you know, if they're they're slightly more closer than the two meters for a short period of time, they're probably okay. But they have to have done the health check first. So, so you know, we can debate till the cows come home how close you are in a boat. But if we go out having been healthy for the last two weeks and we have no symptoms today, the chances are we're going to be okay. Okay. So, and then just following on from that, Anna, I mean, we're obviously. A lot of people are rowing in singles just now, but you know, with regards to crews and when crews can start, uh, you know, training and racing with each other again. There's a question from Christine Hunter at New Key asking, "What safeguards are suggested to reduce droplet transmission?" And again, it's difficult. I mean, you know, you could you could go to the extreme of suggesting that, like on public transport, we wear masks. But actually, I think we'd find in exercise wearing masks is actually quite difficult. It actually restricts how you can breathe and it gets quite uncomfortable and hot. So I think, like I've just said with the health, you know, if you're going to go out in crew boats, then they should be asking each other, are they healthy? They should be honest with each other. If they've got even the very slightest symptom, they should probably not be going out and they should wait for that to subside. I mean, that's actually taking care of their own health as well because there is a big risk of heart and lung complications from COVID-19, even with mild infection. Thank you. Um, and just, um, I guess, one other question on crew boats. Um, I mean, Andy, uh, in, in general terms, uh, what do you see as a roadmap back to crew rowing? This is a question from Emma Kelly at Christchurch. Well, it's hard to say. Uh, we're going to be led by the government's position in terms of how they see us integrating back in. We've got close com communication going with government departments around this, although to be fair, we don't get advance notice when they do change their guidance. Uh, it's clear to me, even as a, as a non-rower and taking the advice that I've got, is that we're going to have to start with small boats um, and what we're trying to do is is create a framework by which we've got singles and doubles out there in a in a meaningful way uh, and that I think is going to be hard for some clubs particularly when the equipment the vast majority of equipment tends to be bigger boats 
So it, it is hard to say. I mean, what I would uh, reassure people, as soon as we get guidance that allows us to change or ease the restrictions that, that we're providing at the moment, we will do so as quickly as possible. But fundamentally, the advice to everyone is, you know, be responsible, make sure you're doing the risk assessment. Uh, and if you see guidance from us and you don't understand it, the first thing is ask us because, do you know what, we might have missed something, we might have overlooked something, we might actually not have thought of that scenario. So please keep keep communicating with us like you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, a question's come in from Fiona Walbridge um, at Southampton. Um, on the number of boats, maybe Nick, this is one for you. Um, I mean, some fairly uh, good, simple questions. How many boats can go afloat in one session? And a follow-up question, if you have family groups who row together, does this affect these numbers? Um, I think the first question is the easy one. Um, government advice is, is six people can, um, as long as they're socially distancing, can be together at any, any one time outside. So um, theoretically, you know, it, it's six singles. Um, that's what we've got, or it could, or it's you know, four singles and two coaches. Um, that that's the mix. Um, the second question, I think, is more difficult. Um, I think it's still six, um, a group of six, um, even though a couple of them are from the same household. But what that would mean, of course, is you could have a mix of, you know, a, say a double or a pair and then and then four singles or two singles and a, and a couple of coaches out there. OK, thank you. And I think probably just to clarify, um, if what I think in case there's any, uh, I don't know, just confusion at all, just we want to say that uh, crew boats are currently, we're not condoning crew boats and advocating that crew boats are, are out in the water just now, unless all are from the same household. Mixing house, households is definitely not okay, just to clear that up. Um, Nick, there's um, just re related to boats and hygiene, uh, there's been a number of questions coming in around uh, cleaning materials uh, and what we can do in order to, to clean our boats. And we've had a, a quite an interesting question from, uh, from Manuela Martino at Year who says they're a chemist and a WSA, and although uh, they understand why using disinfectants is important, we also know that there are risks associated with handling and using bleach, which is harmful, concentrated bleach is corrosive and can cause damage. Um, so the question is, given the associated risks with bleach, is it not just better to use soap? What do you think? So, I mean, we've, we've, we've pondered this question long, long and hard um, and looked at all sorts of legislation. I mean, we, we've, we've taken advice from um, the chair of the safety committee and the um, on your own safety advisor as well. And, you know, looking at sort of government guidance for non-food settings for hard surfaces, um, it looks as if, you know, the, the, the diluted bleach solution is the best one for our equipment. Um, I, you know, appreciate there's maybe some environmental issues there, but we're talking about washing a boat down um, on a hard. I don't think we're looking at a, well, probably any runoff, to be quite honest, in, into water courses. Um, what we would say, what we do say is, you know, follow the instructions on, um, on the product. Um, soap and water, as I understand it, is, is great for, for your hands. If, if breaks down the, the fatty layer of the cells, um, I think bleach just completely kills it off. Um, as I say, we are following what government guidance there is or what we can interpret from it. It would be great if there was government guidance for, for rowing, but um, sadly that doesn't come about. There's a few more important things they think of. So. OK, thank you for that. Uh, and then sort of sticking with science, uh, and it's a question that could uh, be related to exercising or either uh, rowing or exercising as in cleaning your boat. But there's been a question from a Christopher Shea at Tideway Scholars, uh, and Anne, probably one for you, who has asked, is uh, the COVID infection present in sweat? You could be sweating cleaning your boat as well, I guess. So as a the COVID infection <laughs> present in sweat. 
Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, I have checked and currently there is no scientific evidence that COVID is uh, present in sweat. So, so actually sweating is not a problem. It's much more droplets that are the coughing and sneezing and then putting on your hand and touching things, which is the problem, not the sweat. Great. Thank you very much. Now, a number of questions have come in um, on junior rowing. Um, and uh, I guess that Mike Kelly at Christchurch asked uh, a good question, Nick, and it's quite a simple question. What do you see as a pathway to getting juniors back in the water with the additional safety launch cover that they require? I guess that one's coming my way then, is it, Kenny? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that what is good news is now that we've got the the small gathering of six people, it really does mean I think that the majority of clubs can get some form of junior program going. There's the ability there now to um, have a small group of scholars and have good supervisory um, capacity there. Um, in, in line with our safeguarding, safety and codes of conduct for coaches and things, you know. Um, as far as safety launches go, um, we've looked at this again long and hard. Um, and at the moment, we we have to say that, you know, it, it, they're, they're not ideal to use. Um, the, the reason is you, you need two people in a boat to act properly as a safety launch. Um, and you've got, a, in most of our launches, we, we've got social distancing issues there. We've also got um, distancing issues when we have to affect a rescue as well, and that's that putting everybody out there. So I think, you know, if we put some stuff out there about launches, it's really about coach, coaching launches. Um, it may be that you could put a system in place whereby you've sort of got launches that are monitoring groups of athletes rather, rather than safety boats. But um, it, it's got to boil down to you know your risk assessment at the end of the day, and if your risk assessment says that you need a safety launch out there, or if it sorry, if say ten weeks ago it said you needed a safety launch out there, the likelihood is it's still going to say you need a safety launch, and that's just something we we, we can't get away from. Um, if it says you need a coaching launch um, because there is no towpath on your bit of water. Then you know that that's a different that's a different matter, and that's why we put the stuff in the new guidance. Sure, thank you, Andy. In terms of um, coaching, um, uh, is there? Would you like to sort of mention coaching at this point with regards to um, juniors or getting out in the water? Yeah, I think so because when we looked at some of the, the sequencing of getting back on the water, the, the first phase was clearly about recreational activity so what we wanted to be able to do was we wanted to be able to give a framework by which clubs and individuals could actually start accessing the water in single skulls predominantly um, the piece of work that, that nick and his team have been working on more recently is okay what does that mean in terms of our coaching framework because we know the sport relies on lots of coaches we know that coaches want to get back doing their job whether that's professional ones or volunteer ones so we are coming to grips with how we see the coaching framework fitting in the next phase. So look, I think the message to everyone here is we're hoping to be issuing some coaching specific guidance um, further down the line. And we have added a little bit in uh, in version two that went out today or or yesterday, I forget when it was, but um, you know, re which reflects the whole six people legislation that uh, the government just put in. So I think watch this space on the coaching bit, we, but we do understand the frustration of trying to interpret how the government wants us to behave and perform while we're doing our on the water coaching stuff so look watch this space but we are working on that thank you um a slight change of uh topic uh but an important one and one that uh it covers uh grassroots and high performance and that's adaptive rowing and it's a question from caitlin armstrong at the city of oxford um who asks can British Rowing provide any information on a safe route to getting our adaptive para squad back on the water? Are there any resources that we can use to help us plan ahead? Nick, you've um, got experience of, of this as well. What would you suggest uh, to, to Caitlin uh, in Oxford? So, um, 
I think it depends greatly on the on the individual, um, on, on the individual's impairment, um, and I think to um, to try and put a sort of one thing fits all scenario and there just just doesn't work for this. Um, you know, I think in simple terms, the greater the impairment, the more challenging the situation. Um, you know, if somebody needs assistance to get onto water, for instance, that's um, that's going to be quite difficult. Um, but you know, for for many adaptive rowers, it's probably um, not much different to um, a club rower out there. Um, you know, it's it, it is about the risk assessment stuff. Um, and if you if we can do it safely, then um, we, we should be doing it. And that that what should be what leads the decision making process. Thank you. Um, Back to uh, I guess some some people um, within the sport will have had coronavirus um, and uh, you know and they're looking to come to come back into training and we've we've had a question from uh, Brian Chapman thank you Brian for your question uh, and it's we will have people who have tested positive for coronavirus will will British rowing give any advice on how to get back into training as Dr. Anne has suggested even mild symptoms will impact on heart, could impact on heart and lung health. What would you say for people that have had uh, coronavirus and looking to get back into it? Presumably that's for Anne, is it? I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, would, I would have to reflect on our, our actually our own experience in the team. Uh, sadly, we had a fairly large number of the athletes um, have what we believe were co coronavirus infections during lockdown. And the vast majority have taken six to eight weeks to actually get back to the normal training program. So my message would be that you need to go very slowly. Um, the general advice is that once you're symptom free, you should then walk for a period of seven days. And after that, you then introduce very low intensity, probably ergometer work because you can stop. And at any point that you get symptoms, then you stop and go back to the walking. After you've done low intensity on the ergo, you can progress to UT2 or steady state, depending on what you call it. And then you could potentially look at going out on the water, but it could take you a good six to eight weeks, if not longer, to actually get back to a normal training program. So the message would be, if you have had coronavirus, no matter how mild, take it very slowly. And if you have any uh, symptoms arising during your return to training, then you should be advised to go and talk to your GP just in case you have affected your heart or your lungs in a way which needs a bit more attention. Thank you. And then what about people that have uh, had coronavirus, uh, presumably, they, they have some immunity, although I think that's not quite so clear that if you've had coronavirus, you've automatically got immunity, from what I understand. Um, but if people perform uh, and, give, and undertake the appropriate risk assessments and they're completed, and once in the future we're all back out in crew boats, mm -hmm. um, would it be possible for, for people that have had coronavirus to go out in a crew boat, even if they're not from the same household? Once the government guidelines have relaxed and said that we can mix with each other in, in a crew boat, then yes, if you've had coronavirus and you've recovered, there is absolutely no problem with you being close to other people who potentially haven't had it. You're right in what you say, Kenny. Uh, if you've had coronavirus, you're likely to have developed antibodies to the virus. The debate at the moment is how long those antibodies may stay in your system. They could stay forever or they could stay for a few months but it's too early yet in the infection to to know the answer to that question but you are not having had the virus you, you are not a risk to people around you you're only a risk when you still have your symptoms okay uh, and um uh, there's a number of uh, and the questions are coming in thick and fast on a medical um on a me medical uh, point here but um one for uh for you in terms of uh, if someone's had uh, a, a two or three month layoff uh, as a result of either uh, isolation, lack of access to training, 
um, or equipment or even uh, potentially because of a slight illness may not be coronavirus. Any advice advice to people who have been maybe active rowers who've had a two or three month layoff? Yeah, it's the same message. Take it very slowly. But also, I think if you've had a layoff from rowing and you haven't been doing the spinal loading that's required in, in a boat or even on an ergo, then it's well worth, uh, you know, within the club running some sessions which are waking up people's core and slowly introducing the spinal loading. So you're protecting your back as you go back into training. Thank you very much. Um, Andy, one for you. Um, uh, related to finance has come in from uh, Doug Jackson at Budley. Um, other than the very welcome uh, emergency fund from Sport England, uh, which uh, Budley benefited from, membership is falling and we will see no regattas or events this season. Has there ever been a discussion around British Roy using some of their national squad funding to support grassroots? Ah, interesting question. Um, no, not per se, because the limitations of the funding that we get for the elite programme is ring-fenced, as is the Sport England funding ring-fenced to grassroots. That said, I would say that there's been definitely flexibility encouraged by both of those funding bodies, because fundamentally what they want to do is make sure that their public money that they're investing in us is going to a healthy community and supporting us. Uh, and we've certainly seen a lot more collaboration, not, not so much uh, financial shifting of money, but a lot more collaboration from the performance side and the grassroots side than I've ever seen before. The financial position is, is an interesting one in the fact that, that there's no doubt our membership numbers are decreasing during this period. Um, we rely heavily on membership income. That's our single source of unrestricted funding outside of sponsorship, retail and events. Uh, and with no racing, um, clearly we're going to see a decrease in that. Uh, what we've tried to do is we've tried to put some initiatives in place where we've rolled over people's membership if it's lapsed during the period since lockdown. I think it was the 20th of March through to where we are now. Uh, so try to stay engaged with those individuals, make sure they're receiving the content we're developing, can enter the virtual races, all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're confident that once we can get competitions back up, then we can get those membership up to a, to a steady state. Our sponsorship is holding up pretty well right now, and uh, we've had some really, really positive engagement uh, and conversations from SAS Analytics, who we really welcomed their positive contribution just recently, and also Mizuno, who've extended through to, um, through to the Tokyo Games. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, Kenny, but anyway, I've just said it. Um, and the retail is clearly an area that we're down on as well. And we were doing, we were performing pretty well on retail before, but when we sat down and, and assessed this situation right in the early phases, we had a conversation at the board level, which was fundamentally we had two options. We either shut down the business and stop doing everything, um, or we try and maintain our position, push through, continue to provide value for our members, look after our staff and make sure we're being as productive. We, we've clearly done the latter. We are extremely keen to see people back on the water for the reasons I've just mentioned, but I think we can start to now start to see what the future might look like. And at that point, we'll have a better position, better understanding of our financial position. What I would say is what we're experiencing is going to be the same experiences that club, clubs are experiencing. And I know that there is an economic situation out there for individual members that is going to be varied and at times extremely concerning. So we're going to have to tighten our belts in the next year or two, that's for sure. But at the moment, I think we're in a pretty reasonable position given everything that's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, moving on to a question that's come in from Nick, one for you from uh, Rod Murray. Um, and it's uh, one of the big issues on the Thames is the big increase in open, open water swimmers and kayakers. What uh, can British Rowing do or what is British Rowing doing to move in step with other water sport, NGBs, river authorities, etc., on shared river use? Some of the normal courtesies, courtesies seem to have been forgotten, including by the wildlife. Thank you, Rod. Maybe Andy and Nick, if you could uh, pick that one up. Well, funny enough, we've got a, a, a meeting of all the water sports national federations uh, next Monday, I think it is. 
So it'll be interesting to hear what their experiences are. We've had a number of conversations with canoeing and sailing in particular to try and understand how they are working and to try and make sure that our rules are working side by side. Not always possible, but certainly there's been good collaboration there. And if this crisis does nothing, then I do think there's been a greater sense of collaboration between those parties in terms of trying to work with the waterways who have been under extraordinary pressure, um, the Canal and River Trust and obviously the Environment Agency. So uh, that's where we're at at the moment and uh, we'll see what, what happens next Monday in terms of the information sharing there. In terms of what happens on the water, Nick's probably the best person to say and I guess it's a, it's a pretty uh, varied position depending on where you are and who's using that water right yeah i mean it, it's it's a common theme that's coming through from from all regions um and it's it's a really difficult one for anybody to please you know we we certainly can't police it um but like i say you know we can just keep talking to the um other ngbs and hopefully well we know that the messaging that they're putting out is very similar to ours about um being courteous and everything so um i think it's just something that has got to bed down and like you say andy see what what comes out of monday's meeting i think some of these things are just just get amplified because of the situation so things that would normally happen are, are, are becoming more tense uh, and we had a conversation what early this week or late last week around okay, what advice can we provide for clubs whose pontoons are getting taken over by bored teenagers and people who just wanna actually go out and they can't go more than five miles or whatever. And, and I think, you know, these situations happen all the time. They're just more important to us at the, at the moment. And I guess part of the challenge is working out how we try and resolve these things in a, in a mature way that doesn't end up in fisticuffs or calling the police, right? Yeah, I think we're, we're in a real difficult position as well because um, I'm sure Amazon are probably doing a flying trade in, in blow-up kayaks <laughs> and, then, and they're probably not members of um, British canoeing. So, Thank you. Um, I quite, one, one of the, I guess, silver linings of uh, coronavirus for rowing as a sport has been that indoor rowing or training on, off the water has, has taken off in many ways. And we've heard stories that both the main equipment manufacturers, Concept2 and Water Row in the UK have sold out of their, of their rowing machines, which I think is a sign of uh, how popular um, and how needed the, the machines have become. And in fact, I, I saw on uh, eBay at the weekend that um, uh, a, a, an old, a uh, used Concept2 machine was going for about 30% more than the retail price of a new machine <laughs> on eBay. So um, it's good to see uh, it's good to see somebody making money out of coronavirus. <laughs> I've got one, thankfully. But, um, but a question really around uh, indoor rowing, and it's a medical question, Anne, from, from Alice Jenkinson. Alice, thank you for your question. Uh, Anna, Anne said introducing spinal loading slowly was good. Is erging outdoor acceptable whilst clubs and gyms are still shut? Uh, it is indeed, yes. Uh, it, it, you know, that, that's how most of the, the team athletes are actually training, is putting the ergos outside in the garden and, and training. It, it's much more appropriate to use your ergo outside currently than it is inside because the transmission of virus is much less outside than inside. With good air circulation. Um, um, and while I, while I have you, one question that came in was, is there any chance we could get a wave from Sir Steve at some point? Um, <laughs> if, if he happens to walk past, maybe a wave from Steve would be quite helpful. Don't encourage um, him. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> um, I get a one, Andy or, or Nick, um, a question around universities, um, clearly an important uh, area for, for the sport and for, for British rowing will be once universities start uh, start again, and I think it's unclear when that will be for, for some of the universities. Um, 
So that will be important. The university rowing programs get going again. Good for membership. Good for club membership. Good for their own uh, sports clubs. Um, is there any planned guidance to help with universities, um, especially student-led uh, boat clubs, to manage the influx of novices at the start of the year? Um, any any sort of thoughts on that? Well, we were doing pre-COVID. We were developing a set of toolkits under the Club Hub model, we, and one of them was related to universities, in particular how that club captain operates, given that they're a student and a volunteer. Um, it's not something that's actually come up in our conversations as yet in COVID, but it's a really good point, and we'll take that one uh, and put it on the list. The challenge for us, as as pointed out, is universities and schools are a large proportion of our on-water activity and membership. So with the uncertainty around when particularly those schools and universities are going to come back, we've got a job to do to maintain engagement, to give, give value to those individuals so that their programs can continue to, to run once they come back into school. And there's going to be all sorts of pressure on those school kids and university people about their own studies once they do come back in. So it is an area of concern for us as a sport, and I know the sports sector is concerned about the impact of, of that and the time off that those students have. And I think just just to add in, so I was going to say just to add in there, I think with the back to rowing um, group that we've got, we've got some good representation on there from um, university and college rowing. Um, so I think that's that's a, another stepping stone for us um, to work on. Um, but once we get off, off of maybe this setting stone. <laughs> and just link, link to young people and, and juniors and student rowing. Um, Mike Murphy's uh, uh, made a comment, and perhaps you might, you, Nick, you could give him some reassurance. He says, uh, we have 50 plus juniors at Starport, and the management of them returning safely seems to be a bit of a nightmare in the short term. How would you? Uh, you know, what advice could we give to, to Mike and others who have uh, junior programs about uh, safely returning them to, to rowing? It is, it is difficult. Um, it, you know, it, it's one of the most active groups within, within our sport, um, and we need that extra level of um, supervision there um, with juniors as well. Um, I think there's some great work that clubs have done out there already in. Um, putting programs to get or adapting their program, should I say, um, to allow some junior rowing. And I think that there's been good sharing ar around some of the regions of, of those. Um, I think um, there's been there's also been some good forums around the regions where they've shared good practice. Um, you know, we, we can only go on the guidelines that, that we've got out there. Um, but I think go talk talk to your other clubs, your next door neighbours, um, other clubs around your regions and take best practice because um, as Andy said at the very beginning, you know, we've not got all the answers um, and if we're not, if we're not picked up on an idea, ping it our way and we'll certainly look at it but, you know, it's about all of us getting back out there. And I, th I think with the juniors as well, one of the key considerations is as we are working, as we are being all more remote and all more digital, you've got to watch out for those safeguarding provisions because, um, I mean, we issued something, I think, early on in, in the whole lockdown process, but it's important that we understand that we're dealing with juniors under 18s in a different environment and a digital environment, and we have to look after them. And um, just a question, do Andy, um, Issuing guidance for schools separately, do you think we will be issuing guidance for schools separately at some point over the next few weeks? Um, well, look, we're going to take it. Um, Nick and I will sit down after this and maybe not immediately after this, but we're, we will certainly we are listening to what people are saying about schools and universities. And I think that's an area that once we've dealt with the coaching guidance the co and the competitions, which is really important for us to get right in the next sort of few weeks. Then we'll sit down and start thinking around the schools and the universities. Um, but, you know, if you've, got, if you've got people writing in asking questions and they've got particular interest or skill sets, let us know. Uh, let us know what we've noticed throughout this whole crisis 
is there's a whole ton of people out there with good expertise and we're really tapping into it all the time. So if people are out there with expertise, we're very keen to hear from them. Thank you. And uh, we've got a question around um, competition, Nick. And it's um, it's probably a question that many people uh, would love a, a, to hear some some positive news on. Will we see any competition running this year, maybe closer to November or December? And thank you to Sharon Noble for that. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm to get my crystal ball out. Um, we are, we are all um, looking and wanting competition in, in one form or another out there. As soon as you know, as soon as we reasonably can, um, we don't want to rush rush out with competition because you know, as Anne said, people have been um, at home, maybe not training as much and everything. So people do need to get back into some form of fitness um, and, and certain watermanship as well. Um, we're not going to sort of hold back as such on competition, but we need to do it in a, in a structured way. Um, and I would like to think that by, by the autumn that we've got something out there that looks akin to what we all know as some form of competition. I think also, uh, Nick, you talk about sort of in the autumn, we're definitely, and Nick, Nick's group is is leading on this, and we've sort of had even had conversations around it today. Is once we can get back on the water in bigger populations, then there's definitely the ability for us to put in place a framework by which racing tank can take place. It's not going to be the racing that we're used to, which is big, large uh, groups with big support staff and people on the banks, because clearly that's going to have a challenge in terms of social distancing. But we are looking at ways in which we can create league tables, we can have some sort of private match situation so that people can at least race with people in their own local region and then we can start scaling up as the as the government eases those restrictions. So it's definitely something we're keen to get in place. Um, I don't anticipate that's going to happen until July at the earliest, but it's, you know, it would be a real shame if we don't get any racing, even if it's just local racing over the summer when the sun's shining and we've all been locked up for three, four months. So we're working on it. Thank you, Andy. And I guess the link to, to racing, Anne, we've got a few minutes left. Um, the GB rowing team, the athletes, uh, the coaches, the staff, you know, life is, is about competition in many ways. It's about racing. Um, the UK High Performance System is preparing to approach to return to life as normal um, once restrictions are lifting. And you've been heavily involved in looking at and considering a number of steps to help the team do just that, return to normal training and then ultimately return to competition. Just for, for so that people know uh, within the rowing community, just, you know, do you want to give them a flavour of, of the kind of the principles and the steps that the team are taking to um, to just you know come back to normal people environment processes that type of uh, situation yeah i mean i guess the first thing for us has been as i said earlier that the team is spread across the country so we're spending some time debating and discussing at what point it, it's it's fair and right to bring them back together they've obviously got to move households to come back to caversham and that's been a big a big stalling point for us because you know the government is very clear that that's something you're not allowed to do and i think if you read the guidelines you're not allowed to do that even at at elite level um you are allowed to mix households outside which if they were closer to caversham we could put them out together but uh, we can't bring them from all over the country so our first consideration has been to consider their health and their vulnerability but also how how and when could we get them closer to caversham then we had to look at uh, our building how we can maintain uh, social distancing currently within our within the training centre, and that means we've had to create one-way systems through the building uh, and uh, looking at the use of car park, changing rooms, toilets, um, and um, how we do that. We then, once we've considered all those things, we've had to go back to the athletes, or we're having to go back to the athletes, and actually ask them if they're happy with the processes that we put in place do they feel comfortable to come to training and we have to ask them to actually officially opt in 
to the process. They are very much opting in or opting out. If they're not comfortable with anything that's actually been set up, they are allowed to say so, and we need to listen to their concerns concerns and try and address it. So it is quite onerous on our part to try and, as Andy suggested before, mould together all the different advice documents and work something that works in our environment. At the same time, listening to the athletes who would love to get back out on the water. But for various reasons, we've chosen to, to slow that down. Uh, we are hoping to open the centre uh, in a small way early in July, but we probably won't be up and running uh, vaguely normally until September. Thanks, Anne. Uh, uh, if I can, Kenny, uh, just uh, just one one point on that because uh, Anne mentioned it. I mean, our elite athletes are desperate to get on the water, um, and they've been brilliant about not doing so right now because the conditions of which we're trying to operate is that it's recreational rowing only. So, you know, hats off to our rowers who are, you know, they've been training in lockdown for three months now. They really want keen to get back on the water. So we're looking at how we do that in a phased responsible way. But I'd just like to say thank you to them because them doing that, I think, sets a, a really strong message to the rest of the rowing community that it's recreational only. That's it. Um, and the rest will come, come later. Thanks, Andy. We, I think probably get time for one more question. We're sort of Maybe running over slightly now, but um, Clive Pendry, Clive, thank you very much for your question. Um, and he's right to point out that the, the topic tonight, the topics and the conversation has all been about rowing. But Nick, um, what about the support functions like umpires, volunteers, which the sport cannot run without? Um, how would you like to sort of close off this evening um, with sort of some words of encouragement for them? Um, I think it, it's it's been really difficult for for all of the volunteer community, um, whether that's the coaching community or event organisers or umpires, really, and, and you know club volunteers. Um, people haven't necessarily been talking to one another for for ages now, but there there have been some good groups out there that where people have been engaging and everything, um, and I'd really encourage that. Um, there's been there's been all sorts happening out there online. Um, but I think one thing that we do need to um, be wary of is once this is all over, I think that you know, the world will have changed, our sport will have changed, and that means our volunteer base will probably have changed as well. So, um, you know, for, for any athletes out there, um, just be patient, I think, with the people that run your clubs. Um, be patient with your coaches. Um, you know, not everybody will be able to give as much time as they did before. Um, not everybody perhaps will want to give as much time. Um, and one thing that else that comes from this is, you know, we all need to be conscious of um, looking for new volunteers and encouraging um, new people to come into the sport, not only on the water, but, you know, to help us run the clubs, to help us run events and keep our sport that's thriving. Um, going forward but i just say thanks to all of the volunteers out there that have helped throughout this period yeah spot on nick spot on thank you nick um thank you and there are so many more questions um that have come in and comments from people thank you very much indeed uh, for everyone who's taken the time to join us tonight uh, there's andy there's a question around international collaboration uh, and I think it's fair to say uh, that you're, you're, you've been in contact with Visa and there has been good international collaboration over the last last few weeks through coronavirus. Um, but with loads of different uh, topics, it's uh, I mean, I'm sure we could go on all night. So I would just like to sort of wrap up um, and say thank you very much to, to Nick, to Andy, to Anne uh, for giving up your time tonight and also Thank you very much to, to you guys uh, out there for joining us. Uh, we hope you found tonight's lockdown webinar helpful uh, as we all work to get rowing thriving again once coronavirus is under control. Um, by way of follow up, um, we will publish a recording of this webinar uh, on the British Rowing website uh, from tomorrow, Friday the 5th of June. Um, and there are still some questions that um, we probably can can address uh, in writing and we'll publish these and clarify uh, some certain matters that have been flagged on the questions panel 
in the news article about uh, tonight's uh, webinar. But uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and hopefully you can tune into another uh, lockdown webinar soon. But uh, I wish you all a good evening um, and take care. Stay safe. Thank you.